Welcome to AQMD On The Air. I'm your host, Lior Alpern. Our guest today is an expert in healthcare policy and delivery systems. He brings decades of experience in organized healthcare leadership and quality research review. In his capacity as associate professor at the University of Southern California, he was instrumental in implementing one of the first residency programs in emergency medicine and directly involved in the genesis of physician assistant and paramedic programs that now flourish throughout the nation. Working with the Department of Transportation, he assisted in developing a national examination and national standards for paramedics. He has served as president of many healthcare organizations, has written four books on healthcare delivery, and lectures at Masters of Public Health programs. As an active medical policy consultant for the Department of Healthcare Services, he reviews research institutions and employs meta-analysis in reviewing research literature on a daily basis. He became CEO of the South Los Angeles Collaborative to help deliver healthcare and social services to the underprivileged in Los Angeles at a time when the community was suffering its greatest need. He is the past president of the Los Angeles County Medical Association and the current chairman of LACMA's longstanding Air Quality Committee. Dr. Delibero, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Lior. I want to tell you that the physicians of the Los Angeles County Medical Association have had a long interest in not only air quality but also public health. The first public health system in the county of Los Angeles was formed by our medical association. Way back in 1920, before anyone was really considering the ill effects of environmental air pollution, one of our doctors Dr. Barrow, Dr. John Barrow, did a study on a number of his patients. He found some interesting things. He found that a great deal of his patients were affected by the quality of the air in the Los Angeles basin and differentiated among people who lived in the heart of the basin and those out of the basin. In particular, he found one patient where he attributed death to exposure to the environment. Now, when he announced his findings uh, at the committee, and then it was picked up in the newspapers, I guess that was published, and he was shot down. And it was that way for quite a while. In the early 1940s, uh, LACMA established its Air Quality Committee. <laughs> and uh, that is what I am the chair of uh, today. In the 1940s, it was, smog was a big deal. And uh, Lachman was very concerned about smog because they were always advocating for their patient's health. Mm -hmm. And what was this that was interfering with their patient's health? Why were they seeing all these respiratory problems in their patients? The, problem, the uh, question had to be answered. Well, the question was finally answered by another Lachman physician who was also a professor at USC, professor of pathology. This. Uh, was Professor Paul Cotton. Uh, Dr. Cotton uh, did an amazing thing. He, he, was, he was a pathologist and he observed that the lungs at autopsy on patients who were city dwellers were quite different from the lungs at autopsy from those patients who dwelled outside of the city. He noticed a grayish discoloration of the lungs and he published this. So now there was some proof of what Dr. Barrow had to say. In the 1950s, another LACMA physician, Dr. Al Field, promoted the idea that cigarette smoking was harmful to your health. He had a difficult path ahead for him because he also was opposed by the tobacco companies. But after multiple, multiple, multiple resolutions to the AMA and to the CMA and, and local lobbying, finally the word got out. And the word not only got out locally, it got out to all of California, to the nation, and now the whole world knows that you get cancer from smoking cigarettes. But this is, this is where, this is where you know, it, it initially uh, started. Well, time goes on, the time clock goes on, and, and by the 1990s, it, the pathophysiology of exactly what was happening with air pollution was finally described. It was noted at that time that there were particles in the air. 
Not only smog. Smog uh, was defined by LACMA in 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 the in the in the 40s as as a combination of aromatics mixing with nitrous uh, oxides in the air in the presence of uh, of sunlight to form ozone, a low-lying ozone, which then was harmful to the health. But apart from that is the particles, and that's what we're really concerned about today, is the particulate matter. And this didn't get, the pathophysiology here was described in the 1990s. Uh, how can I describe it to you? Well, let's take a hair, okay? Don't laugh. <laughs> there might be a hair there. <laughs> let's take a human hair. And if you look at that human hair on end, you're actually looking at it at end, it's sort of like a circle. A particle of that size gets into your lungs. It irritates the cilia of the lungs, which a little hair is in the lungs, and causes local inflammation in the trachea. And this local inflammation then causes swelling, causes respiratory symptoms, causes asthmatic attacks. But there's more. If you look at that little piece of pie, say you put that on a microscope, and you take a very sharp blade and you cut that whole pie into six little pieces of pie, those little particulate pieces of pie are, are more harmful than the large one. The little particulate pieces of pie get into your lungs, go down into the sacs of the lungs, the alveoli as they are called in the lungs, and they line the alveoli, they choke off the alveoli. They decrease the oxygen transport across the VLI. They are responsible for premature deaths, for decreased lung development, for cancer, and many other things. Now, this was described in the 90s. By the time of Y2K, further evidence found even smaller particles. If you take that little cut of the piece of pie, now put that under not a regular microscope, but say an electron microscope and use a laser and you cut that little pieces, that, that little cut up into four or five little pieces right there, then you have something that's called a nano, a nanoparticle. And these nanoparticles are real devils. They come in, go all the way down to the VLI and they don't stop there. They go right into the bloodstream. They go right into the bloodstream, travel throughout your body, cause cancer elsewhere, cause heart disease, strokes, and this is what the research is at today, and all of this is proven today. Now, since we have the proof, we go now with our proof and want to educate the doctors and the public. And the doctors was our first, was our first priority in educating, was educating the doctors. Mm -hmm. So uh, back in uh, 2006, uh, we set up a, a, a seminar in Chicago and we invited the doctors from all the port cities because port pollution, as you know, is, is, is a terrible uh, a problem, which is diesel pollution and, and, and then into trucks and planes and so forth. If you would like, I, I, let me t talk a bit about that. One, one ship coming into port is a terrible polluter. Sixteen ships pollute as much as one million cars. And you can imagine there's 16 ships coming into port all the time. Now they're burning an awful, awful fuel called bunker fuel. Bunker fuel is just one grade again uh, uh, above tar. It has to be heated and heated and heated and then expanded in order to just, to, just to burn it. And it is terribly polluting, especially with sulfur fumes. So one of our efforts initially was to get the ships to voluntarily change at least into ordinary diesel fuel. And that helped a lot. But then there was a matter of trains and, and trucks polluting in the port area because they would just leave their engines running when they weren't doing anything. And a big effort is made in Long Beach and San Pedro now to decrease that. But still we have the big polluters that are coming out, which are basically the truck diesels. And they're coming out basically through the freeway system. And as they come out through the freeway system, anyone who lives along that freeway system also is going to be exposed. Mm -hmm. There have been studies shown that if you live close to a source of pollution, like a freeway or a refinery, mm -hmm. your chances of respiratory disease and cancer are increased. There's a difference if you live within half a mile 
one mile or beyond one mile from a freeway. And, you know, this sort of brings up also the topic of who lives where. And you will find that, not unexpectedly, the population that lives within that half a mile range are, are diverse populations of poor people. And they suffer most, which, which uh, is quite unfortunate, which is because we, we now call, and LACMA published, their finding as basically environmental injustice. Well, from there, uh, we've gone forward even further. As you know, last year we uh, uh, partnered with the Air Quality Management District and we produced a video and we've put this video on our website. We now have a, a special website for air quality called curetheair.com. It's all in one word. It's, no, it's not hyphenated or no punctuation between curetheair.com. And on this website, <clears throat> we're not only posting the video that we work together on, but we're going to be posting seminars for physicians to let them learn about what's going on. Our efforts next year are, are, are even beyond that. Well, continuing as a patient advocate, we realize we have to get out into the political scene. We realize also that we have to educate medical students. So we're working with the University of California to develop a curriculum on air quality for medical students. And we're working also to bring our message to the greater population to the, and lobbying in Sacramento. Well, that's, that's kind of a, like a, a sort of a timeline of what, what we've been doing. And uh, maybe that helps as a little introduction of where we are today. Dr. Delibro, uh, you mentioned environmental justice and the communities that are exposed to disproportionately higher levels of air pollution. Yes, it did. As you might be aware, uh, environmental justice is an integral part of what the AQMD is doing, and it's part of our mission statement. Uh, could you share with us a bit more about the work that you have done in those communities and perhaps some of the upcoming um, programs and, and efforts that you're involved in? Let me start with the proof that this does exist. There's a very uh, good study that was done, I think, in, the, in 1998 in Lo Los Angeles that showed that kids living near the freeway were more proportionately affected than kids living away from the freeway and that people in general living in close proximity to polluting areas were subject to cancer and other problems to a higher extent than people outside. Truck drivers have three times the incidence, two to three times the incidence of, uh, of uh, respiratory problems and cancers as uh, other people in other professions because they're constantly exposed uh, to, this, to this type of environment. Uh, you know, we are so concerned about things like the, the dumping in the Gulf. The dumping in the Gulf, we heard for two months, everybody was, was pinned to their TV set to see what was happening. We were told that they were dumping 9,000 tons of uh, pollutants into the sea every day. Well, it finally ended, uh, but uh, all of a sudden the interest waned. Well, you know it is a fact that in our South Coast Air Basin alone, we spill 6,900 tons of pollutants, not into the sea, but into our air, every single day, day after day. It's, keep on, it's going on, it's going on, it's going on. We have to make the public really, really aware of it. The biggest study on the uh, effect on kids in the environment we're talking about uh, uh, environmental justice. The biggest study that I know of was among 40,000 kids in Italy and they studied the kids who were close in the streets with, with, with the pollutants versus kids who were outside and they have a very st significant statistically proven study that the exposure decreased lung development and increased respiratory systems, uh, uh, symptoms. Um, what can we do about this? Number one, we have to make people aware, the awareness. And that's why we have our website, and that's what you guys are doing, too. You're doing a great job making people aware. People have to become aware. If, if we could get the interest of the public, 
to peak as much it was, as it was interested during the dumping in the Gulf, it would be fantastic. They would really have people understanding. And it's there. The same stuff is there right now. People are concerned about traffic accidents. They're concerned about uh, people dying in traffic accidents. Over 3,000 people a, a year die in California in traffic accidents. Well, three times that amount. Over 9,000 people a year die because of air pollution. Why not be concerned? If you're concerned about traffic accidents, you must be concerned about air pollution. And it's, it's a concern that we have to get out, and, and I think that's what we're trying to do. And that's our joint effort, let's put it that way. What are some other technologies, uh, Dr. Delibero, that could be alternatives to diesel fuel? Well, one thing in trains, for instance, is to use the electromagnetic type engines instead of the diesel engines, which would be really clean. That would be wonderful, and, and they're faster and better, and, and, and the technology is really developing, and I think that's where we're going to be in the future, especially when we get this bullet train that uh, is, is now okay on the ballot coming down from uh, uh, the middle of California from San Francisco to San Diego eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, uh, natural gas is the cleanest burning thing, and that can be used in diesels. It can be used in cars. It can be used anywhere. You know, it's always a fight. It's a fight saying, you know, if we go one way, we're going to decrease petroleum, we're going to lose jobs and so forth. But if you go to alternatives, you actually create jobs for the alternatives. Mm -hmm. And you also have to realize that the health effects are very expensive. And if you can save $19 billion in health treatment, that's a big savings. Mm. So there, it's a balance that we have to go through politically, and that's why we are lobbying now very actively. And we're working with, the, with, the air, uh, with not only you in, in Southern California, with the Air Resources Board in Sacramento, mm -hmm. and we have uh, uh, testified before them. We even testified before the Board of Supervisors. Back in the 50s, the Lackman testified before the Board of Supervisors and closed schools and cl uh, f football games. It was a big deal. Made the front page above the, above the fold of the LA Times that so we were closing uh, uh, schools and, 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 and prohibiting football games when, and, when the smog levels were that high. Hmm. You know, uh, another, another doctor uh, uh, from the Los Angeles Co uh, County Medical Station, uh, uh, Paul Cotton, did another study, and uh, he showed that in some of his patients were very heavy smokers, as, as opposed to his other patients, their tolerance for exercise was decreased, and that in days when the AQMD posted high smog levels, they could only walk one block before we close, I wanted to tap into your expertise. You mentioned earlier AQMD and LACMA working together. If you want to share a little more about that, uh, what we're working on together now with resolutions leading up to perhaps uh, working together on federal policy on transportation, and then also for physicians here in the South Coast region and how they can work together with AQMD and get resources to their patients. Well, the one thing that we partnered on last year was this video that we're, we're having on our website, curetheair.com. Mm -hmm. And we're sending this video out to all our LACMA physicians so they can post it in their offices, waiting rooms. Mm -hmm. So when the patients are in the waiting rooms, they can see the video. Uh, for, and also, as you, you're very well aware, we presented resolutions to the CMA, which are being brought to the AMA, which then would be hopefully lobbied on for national uh, action for air quality. And, and this is, and oh, I, another thing, we've put questions in the recertification examinations physicians, mm. in particular on air quality, so they're going to have to learn to pass. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. DeLibro, it's been a pleasure having you on our show. Thank you for joining us and for your commitment and leadership to helping us clean the air we breathe. Thank you so much, Leo. It was a pleasure and an honor for you to have me here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our show. Thank you for watching AQMD on the Air. Visit cleanairconnections.org to find out how you can help us clean the air that we breathe. Let's work